My name is Judy Human, and I am the Special Advisor for International Disability Rights here at the U.S. Department of State, and I would like to welcome all of you. Um, we still have some more people who are at the security area coming in, but we thought, you can't hear me. Um, can other people hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so we'd like to welcome you, and today um, our session is going to be moderated by Mr. John Kemp. Um, before I introduce him, I really wanted to thank everybody who is here and will be coming. We have about 170 people registered uh, from outside of the Department of State and USAID, and that means that we will have many other people joining us in and out over the next two days from uh, both state and USAID. So I'd like to also thank the team um, in our office, all the people in the Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor Office, and all the other offices that have really worked so very hard on putting this meeting together. Uh, the meeting over the next two days is really intended to expand and continue the development work that has been going on, bringing together international human rights and development organizations, including disabled people's organizations, to continue to work on ramping up the inclusion of disability in the work that we are all doing, and also to help facilitate the knowledge and experience um, of disabled people's organizations that are also doing development work. Um, I'd like to thank a few people right now who are not up on the podium. Um, may I please uh, say Ambassador at Large C.J. Cook, who's been a tremendous supporter of us in the International Religious Freedom Office, and also Das Cook from the International Organization. Could you raise your hand? Can you raise your hand? Thank you. Um, Nerissa has really been very supportive of the work that we've been doing and also worked with us yesterday on a meeting that we had to discuss work that the ILO and U.S. Business Leadership Network are doing in the area of disability. So the next two days are going to be very busy. Um, they're intended to be very interactive. Uh, we see this very much as a learning experience and the only way that people are going to be able to learn is if we actively participate. So it's now my privilege to introduce our moderator for today, uh, John Kemp, who some of you know and others will know by the end of today. Uh, John is currently the president and CEO of Abilities, Inc. in New York State, which was formerly called the National Center for Disability Services. John is very widely known and respected for his many achievements both in the corporate and nonprofit worlds. He is a person who has a disability, grew up with his disability, and so has incredible experience with lifelong disability. Um, he received the Henry B. Betts Award, which was a very prestigious award in the area of disability in the United States, given by the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago and the American Association of People with Disabilities, recognizing his work and scope of influence that he has had in the United States. Um, he, John also uh, was an advisor uh, to Secretary Rice uh, when disability began to be uh, advanced here at the State Department and USAID. So it's my privilege to introduce John Kemp, longtime friend. Thank you, Judy, and thank you for your incredible leadership throughout your life. Um, uh, the, the Betts Award was mentioned. Who won the first Betts Award? Judy Heumann. Uh, and she continues to lead all of us. So thank you, Judy, and thank you, State Department and USAID. Um, Judy touched upon the purposes of the meeting, and I just want to restate that this is where we're going to learn from the experts why disability must be included in all as aspects of development. Uh, for the DPOs that are here, for the NGOs that are here who maybe are just thinking about getting into these issues, disability must be included. We must include disability across all NGO activities and DPO, obviously. Today we have among our conference participants representatives of U.S. government agencies, 
human rights organizations, international development organizations, disabled persons organizations, and other civil society organizations. We have foundations and private sector companies. Disability activists from Ghana, Indonesia, the Solomon Islands, Uganda, Zambia. Representatives of other governments as well and the media. Why is the subject of disability rights important? It seems rather obvious to all of us, but when we think about it on a global basis, over one billion people with disabilities in the world uh, exist according to the World Report on Disability published by the World Health Organization and the World Bank in 2011. Thus an estimated 15% of any population has a disability and that may vary from country to country based on a variety of factors. Healthcare probably one of the biggest ones. Thus making people with disabilities the largest minority group in the world, one that anyone can join and the number is growing due to the aging population. People with disabilities find their basic rights regularly violated in virtually every country in the world. For this reason, the UN adopted in 2006 the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, CRPD. Now ratified by 113 countries including the European Union. Thanks to the CRPD, there is an increasing recognition by governments that action is required to promote and protect the rights of children youth and adults, men and women with disabilities. This conference, as you can tell from the agenda, is comprehensive. This conference is composed of expert panels and breakout sessions and workshops to examine rights violations against persons with disabilities. Identify why it's important to promote and monitor disability rights. Present examples of what organizations are doing to combat these violations and describe partnerships and other ways to promote disability rights and inclusion. Note takers will be present in each session to capture key ideas and information which will be used to inform the further formulation by the State Department of an international disability rights policy as well as for the preparation of a summary, summary report of, of this conference. Excuse me. Um, I'd also like to thank the United Nations agencies who are also here today. I neglected to mention them and I do appreciate the fact that they are here as well. To get us started, we are privileged to have an announcement from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton who has remarks for our meeting. I am delighted to lend my voice to this very important conference. The protection of human rights is a cornerstone of our foreign policy and a personal passion of mine. All people everywhere have the right to live productive lives free from discrimination and with equal access to our opportunities everywhere. And this includes people with disabilities. But you know and I know too often and in too many places, these rights are violated because of prejudice, discrimination, indifference, ignorance, and inaction. Many people with disabilities are hidden and isolated by their own families and communities because of fear, embarrassment, and stigma. Then they can be trafficked and exploited by those who do not respect their basic humanity. They are confronted every day by physical, legal, and social barriers that limit whether they can work or go to school. This is an affront to our common humanity, but it also limits economic development and tears at the fabric of societies. That's why the State Department is making the inclusion of persons with disabilities an important element of our policies and practices. Our Special Advisor for International Disability Rights is working to include the rights of all persons with disabilities across the Department's diplomatic and programmatic initiatives. Our embassies are working around the world to protect and promote those rights as well. And we are trying to connect governments with the expertise and technical assistance they need and empowering civil society to become better advocates for persons with disabilities. So these are some of the basic principles that unite us in our common purpose. Let us redouble our efforts to tear down those shameful walls of exclusion 
and to create new pathways for participation, empowerment, and progress. Thank you very much. Great. Wonderful remarks by the Secretary. Thank you very much. And now our first speaker is Michael Posner, Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Assistant Secretary Posner was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary on September 23, 2009, prior to joining the State Department. Mr. Posner was Executive Director and then President of Human Rights First. As its Executive Director, he helped organize helped the organization earn a reputation for leadership in the areas of refugee protection, advancing a rights-based approach to national security, challenging, oh, sorry there, challenging crimes against humanity and combating discrimination. He has been a frequent public commentator on these issues and has testified dozens of times before the U.S. Congress. In January 2006, Mr. Posner stepped down as the executive director to become president of Human Rights First, a position he held until his appointment as assistant secretary. He has also been a prominent voice in support of fair, decent, and humane working conditions in factories throughout the global supply chain. As a member of the White House Apparel Industry Partnership Task Force, he helped found the Fair Labor Association, an organization that brings together corporations local leaders, universities, and NGOs to promote corporate accountability for working conditions in the apparel industry. He was also involved in the development of the Global Network Initiative, a multi-stake initiative aimed at promoting free expression and privacy rights on the internet. Assistant Secretary Posner. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, uh, John, for that very warm introduction. I want to welcome you all here. We're delighted to have you here, and this is an important gathering. I want to say a special thanks to uh, Judy uh, Human, who really is a force of nature. Uh, she has been a, an unbelievable, uh, an unbelievably uh, welcome and wonderful addition to the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And she's assembled a terrific team. Uh, Kathy Guernsey's here, Bob Ransom, and others. Uh, they are doing every day uh, the work that we need to be done to reinforce the notion that disability rights are human rights. Uh, this is a long, too neglected area in our uh, both domestic and foreign policy. And Judy has been in the middle of this fight in several capacities, but has really brought this issue front and center within the State Department. These issues are important in their own right, um, and uh, at the same time, they're cross-cutting issues that affect everything we do in the range of uh, international diplomacy. They're part of what <laughs> Secretary uh, Clinton has called sustainable democracy. And uh, when we talk about democracy, we're not just talking about elections. We're talking about a range of issues that basically create a sustainable uh, democratic foundation. Rule of law, accountability, transparency, uh, the importance of civil society, a free press, the ability of groups, including those that are vulnerable, to have a full voice in their society is critical to a sustainable democracy. And what this meeting is about today is to try to reinforce the notion that people with disabilities need to have a seat at the table, they need to have a voice, and we in our foreign policy need to find every way we can to reinforce the importance uh, of, of this community. Um, we are, I, I was very struck last week, I was in China and I was involved some in the uh, case of Chang Guan Sheng. Um, the origin of his activism is a fight for the rights of disabled people. He brought a lawsuit in his home province um, that was basically brought against tax authorities who were supposed to be giving uh, benefits uh, to people with disabilities and they weren't doing it and he succeeded. And that case in a way reminded me that often in the pursuit of equal treatment and into discrimination for people with disabilities, um, those issues become human rights issues. They are human rights issues, and people who work on those issues uh, become part of the larger human rights struggle. 
We're talking now today, and I think in this two, these two days, I hope that we get from you a range of ideas of how we can develop a policy framework for addressing these issues as a matter of U.S. foreign policy. I've talked to Judy uh, several times repeatedly about the, the notion of institutionalizing our approach, developing a more systematic response um, to a range of issues relating to the rights of disabled people as part of our foreign policy. Uh, diplomacy uh, is a piece of that. Public diplomacy is a piece of that. Uh, grant making and development. We need to take a rights-based approach to development. Uh, I want to give a couple of examples of things that Judy and her team have done. Um, we are now engaged, and she's engaged, <clears throat> in a range of activities looking at equal participation for people with disabilities in elections, uh, equal access, the ability to participate in the political democratic process. Um, we've integrated uh, issues of disability more into our regular diplomacy. Judy was an active part uh, last November in a, a bilateral dialogue on human rights that we did with the government of Vietnam. She's traveled extensively and raised these issues with our diplomats and with those uh, in other governments. We need to sustain that and make that a piece of what every diplomat is doing. Uh, and then in grant and in public diplomacy, again, Judy's been a terrific voice, but we need more voices to be out there publicly saying that this is part of what the United States government cares about. The community of, uh, of people with disabilities are people we will stand up for and work for and demand an end to discrimination and equal opportunity. And then finally, last month in uh, our guidelines for grant making, um, we included uh, as a weighed uh, criteria uh, the uh, uh, a question as to whether or not grants empower uh, persons with disability as well as women, uh, racial, ethnic, religious minorities. Uh, you can find that in our revised uh, program guidelines. So for us, and for me in particular, and our bureau, uh, this meeting is an opportunity to hear from you, to have, to get ideas, to generate ideas, to give us the tools we need to make disability rights a central part of the human rights agenda and to make the human rights agenda a central part, as Secretary Clinton said, of what the United States does, what we stand for, and how we promote these issues, both in our own country and around the world. I want to thank you all for being here. Welcome. We're delighted you're here. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is Sarah Mendelson, Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at the U.S. AID. Sarah currently serves as Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau uh, responsible for de democracy and governance. She joined the Obama administration in this role in May 2010. Prior to her current position, Ms. Mendelson was the Director of Human Rights and Security Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She has worked for nearly two decades on a wide variety of issues related to rights and democracy, including in Moscow as a program officer with the National Democratic Institute in 94 and 95. Be before, com be before coming to CSIS, she was a professor of international politics at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. At CSIS, she conducted a dozen public opinion surveys in Russia, tracking views on Chechnya, HIV AIDS, military and police abuse, religious identity in the North Caucasus, as well as knowledge and experience with human trafficking. She has researched the links between human trafficking and peacekeeping operations in the Balkans, and her work helped shape U.S. legislation and policies at NATO on this issue. In 2007-2008, she led a working group on the closing of Guantanamo, the recommendations from which were reflected in the executive orders signed January 22, 2009. In the summer of 2009, she helped convene the Parallel Civil Society Summit in Moscow during President Obama's trip to Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Mendelson. Thank you. 
thank you so much. Um, I'm humbled to be here. Uh, congratulations on this very important convening. Um, it's been two years tomorrow that I've uh, been with USAID, and in that time, the work, I think, on disabilities has been among the most important that I've seen in the field. It's certainly among the most memorable that I'll, I'll take away from my time in government. Let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and then ask for uh, advice and, and help over the next two days. Um, it is, I think, important to recognize that disability inclusion and rights have not historically been part of the work of either mainstream human rights organizations or development organizations. That isn't to say that it wasn't going on, it was, but it wasn't always put on a platform in the way that we're trying to do now. Uh, we have leadership at USAID that has made inclusive development uh, a critical priority, and we are organizing ourselves uh, to fulfill that vision. Specifically, um, about two months ago, we launched a new center of excellence on democracy, human rights, and governance. For the first time at USAID, we have a separate human rights team in this center. Uh, disabilities is in the human rights team as opposed to standing separate and alone. Uh, we're programming over $20 million a year around the world in, in disabilities, but the way that we can make this work most meaningful is through integrated programming, not standalone programming. And we're striving every day to try and figure out how to advance that. Um, integration is a big theme at USAID these days. Uh, it's part of a, a set of larger reforms that we are advancing called USAID Forward. Um, and I think that it's, to make it meaningful, uh, we need to be really looking at evidence that the integration of, uh, whether it's human rights, democracy, sound governance, specific focus on di disabilities, has very specific impacts on our development goals in general. Um, that's, a, that's, that's hard sometimes. You have to structure programs to be able to capture what the impact of the investments has been. But with your help, I think that we're, we're able to do that. Um, I don't think we really have any choice. I think that for our vision of inclusive development over the next decade is to have disabilities rights woven into all the work that we do in human rights um, and larger development goals. Um, we are very much doing this on the elections front. Um, and rather than waiting for five, 10 years down the path, as soon as we begin new programs on elections, we have disabilities woven into it. And I'm, I'm, I wanna applaud our partners uh, at IFAS and NDI and, and IRI for this work. Um, but we need to do more. Um, and when we have big government initiatives, for example, the Open Government Partnership, uh, which is a platform where governments uh, are, are coming together with civil society to make sure that uh, citizens' voices are heard and governments are responding, that all voices are counting, are being counted, uh, and that disabilities is a part of that. Every single time we have some major initiative, making sure that the disabilities piece is front and center is really gonna help. Um, one of the, the uh, maybe the strangest lessons I've learned in government is there's small bureaucratic fixes that can have long-term uh, effects, echo effects. So even, uh, as Mike was saying, in the grants uh, guidance, having language in a request for proposals uh, that makes clear we're asking our partners to show how disabilities is reflected is, you know, these are important demand signals that need to be sent. Um, so please hold us accountable. Please be providing us suggestions. Uh, and we look forward to reporting back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Administrator Mendelson. Um, now we're going to turn this over to uh, Judy and to Charlotte to give remarks, Charlotte Nalapo. And um, I would like to, I, I'm sure you all know who they are, but just in case you don't know who they are, let me just get my glasses on to make sure that you get the proper due. Because these are not only good friends, but incredible leaders in the disability rights world.
Judy is internationally recognized leader in the disability community, lifelong civil rights advocate. She was appointed special advisor for international disability rights at the State Department in June 2010. She previously served as director of the Department on Disability Services for the District of Columbia where she was responsible for the Developmental Disability Administration and the Rehabilitation Services Administration from 2002 to 2006. She served as the World Bank's first, first advisor on disability and development. She was lead consultant to the Global Partnership for Disability and Development and from 1993 to 2001, Judy served in the Clinton administration as assistant secretary for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services in the Department of Education. Charlotte McLean Nalapo, coordinator for disability inclusive development at USAID. Ms. McLean Nalapo, or Charlotte, it's okay, was formerly World Bank senior operations officer in the Human Development Network, working on East Asia and Pacific region and the African region. Ms. Nalapo is a human rights lawyer with particular interest in marginalized groups. In 1999, she was appointed by President Mandela to the South Africa Human Rights Commission and reappointed by President Mbeki in 2002. She has served as an expert on a number of UN committees in the area of child rights, the right to food, and the right of rights of people with disabilities. She has also represented the national human rights institutions at the UN during the process of developing the UN Convention for the, uh, on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Ms. Nalapo has lectured and presented on human rights and development issues in numerous, on, on numerous occasions and in a range of forums. I would like ask, to ask each of them for remarks and maybe a little Q&A. Questions, go questions. Do you want to ask the, just go right straight to them? Okay. We're going to go straight to the questions. So, why is disability rights inclusion important for the State Department first and USA, USAID second? So first I'd like to say that um, we hope that one of the new ventures that's moving forward is the fact that state and USAID are working collaboratively together. Uh, we organized this meeting together. Charlotte and I work on a regular basis together. And we're trying to put forward uh, the fact that the inclusion of disability is something that we both need to be focusing on. And our position of inclusion of disability across state and USAID is the mantra that we uh, work towards. Um, for the State Department, as Mike began to say earlier, um, it is very, as the Secretary was saying, um, the inclusion of disabled people is obviously important because of not only the numbers of disabled people that there are in the world, but the breadth of reasons why disabled people become disabled. Um, so we know that many people are acquiring disabilities in conflict situations, mental health disabilities, physical disabilities, sensory disabilities. Um, so from that perspective alone, it's critically important for us that we're not only engaged in working on assisting governments in uh, resolving problems, moving in the direction of peace and development of democracy, but we also need to be able to assist those countries and as conflicts end in helping to ensure that, yes, elections are democratic and moving forward, but we have to also make sure that we are really addressing the needs of people who have acquired disabilities, in many cases in very violent situations. So uh, we're dealing with the actual disability that the person is having to address, but we're also dealing in many cases with mental health issues that uh, frequently are not given appropriate attention. Um, for the State Department also, it's important um, in moving forward with the direction that the Secretary has given us uh, to ensure that all people in communities are considered to be equal and valuable people. In the area of disability in many countries, and actually we should say all countries, while some countries have uh, more, made more progress over the last number of decades, it's fair to say that every country around the world still does not consider all disabled individuals as equal citizens. And we can see that in the practices that uh, are still engaged with every day. So from the State Department's perspective, 
um, the equality of all people and looking at the causes of that lack of equality are very important. The engagement and inclusion of disability in the work that our embassies are doing is equally important because we know that helping to ensure that disabled people are front and center publicly at meetings that we're holding, at discussions that are being held, both elevate the status of disabled people within their countries, but also from a substantive perspective, bring the voices and needs of disabled people to the table. And I might just add that from a development perspective, um, disability is not just a human rights issue, but it's very much a development issue. Um, and I think when we look at the research, we know that 80% of persons with disabilities live in developing countries. And that's where USAID works. And so we have to contend with the fact that we are working in, air, in, in countries where there are large populations of persons with disabilities. The fact that we're looking at country ownership in terms of our programming requires us to be more responsive to the fact that this is, this is, a play, this is where persons with disabilities are. Um, I think the other important issue for why disability inclusive development is so important for the work of USAID is that, again, research shows us that persons with disabilities in the developing world, and actually in the developed world, almost always are amongst the poorest of the poor. And I think that that is an important issue because when we look at their vulnerability as a result of poverty, that's heightened by discrimination, stigma, and prejudice. This is a category, a large demographic, 15% of the world's population that we really should be looking at. And then I think as Sarah said, if we don't start ensuring that we include people with disabilities in our own programming, there's no way we're going to meet the development goals. And so that too, that too is an impart, important piece of, of our work. And then finally, I think it's, it's important just to mention that USAID actually does have a disability policy. So there is a requirement um, for us to include people with disabilities in our work. Um, so I think for me, it, it's important to look at this in, in two ways. I mean, it's certainly a human rights issue but it's very much a development issue. Um, and so as we work towards um, addressing issues um, around the development goals and working towards fulfilling those development goals, it becomes absolutely essential that our programming and our policies are inclusive of persons with disabilities. So what are some of the challenges, some of the barriers that you face personally here uh, in, in trying to move this agenda forward? Certainly the audience is made up of NGOs and DPOs that are or maybe are considering getting into this, but what are some of the challenges and barriers? Well, John, I think for me some of the, the challenges and barriers are so the issue around knowledge. Um, and I think knowledge within the agency so getting colleagues in the agency to better understand what it means to include persons with disabilities. So the how-to piece is an important um, challenge um, for, for moving this agenda forward. But I think it's also a challenge um, in terms of our implementing partners. And I think they struggle with the same kind of how-to piece as well. And so I think it's really important that we have together come here um, to begin to start addressing some of these issues and, and thinking, thinking about how we can include persons with disabilities. I find that in my work, another challenge is the issue um, around the fact that people continue to work in silos. And so while we understand that disability is a cross-cutting issue, people still work in silos. So, so getting past that, that silo piece um, certainly remains a major challenge. Um, and then I think getting people to see that disability is part of their work and not just 
my work and Rob Hovart's work is really important. So getting people to understand that whether you're working on democracy or education or health care or health issues, disability is part of that. Um, so mainstreaming it within the issue, within the agency, mainstreaming it um, amongst implement implementing partners, I think are some of the ma major challenges. Judy? Yeah, carrying forward on what Charlotte has been saying, it's uh, very obvious that even if we look in the United States, where I believe we've had great laws and good implementation of our laws and many barriers being removed as a result of good laws and good implementation, uh, that we still face many barriers. Employment being one of the most critical where we still see disabled individuals as the highest unemployed people within the United States. So when we're uh, looking at um, barriers and challenges, we, as Charlotte was mentioning, the need for the, the people who work both directly in state and USAID and the people who are implementing grants and contracts from state and USAID, uh, their lack of knowledge is one aspect. But there's also, I believe, a lack of um, breaking bread together, a lack of sharing, a lack of really understanding that um, people who have various forms of disabilities can in fact make major uh, contributions to society if we remove those barriers. We understand this more clearly, I think, in areas like gender, where the women's movement has been very successful in being able to argue that if a girl doesn't receive an education, She's obviously going to have much more difficulty in being able to make the academic advancements that she needs to be able to contribute to her community. But lo and behold, as girls begin to receive education, we see all of these miraculous statistical studies which are showing the value of women receiving an education. The same thing is true in the area of disability. But when we look at data, for example, from the World Bank, we see that the largest group of people who are not receiving educations internationally are disabled children. And we still see in more advanced countries or Western countries or countries with more financing uh, that while our laws have been having a positive effect, we still do not see the same number of disabled individuals moving into universities. We still do not see the same number of individuals graduating from universities, and the disparities exist um, more greatly when we also look at minority populations within the disability community. So I discuss this as a challenge and a barrier because the people who are on the ground ha having to implement uh, the guidance and directives that we're moving forward need more knowledge and expertise so they really can be driving the train um, in a meaningful way. And I think that's really one of our objectives is to really help people learn enough, not just by themselves, but within their organizations and working collaboratively beyond the stovepipes within our respective organizations, but also looking at ways of working with other organizations, UN family, uh, domestic organizations in the case of uh, the United States and other countries are agencies that deal with education and healthcare, legal reforms, et cetera, are great ways for us to be able to learn more about what in fact has been happening in a constructive way. I think one of the other challenges that we're working on is that there's very much a divide between the work that we do domestically and the work that we do internationally. And yet in all in, in countries that are making improvements domestically in areas like physical design, accessibility for deaf individuals, blind individuals, persons with mental health disabilities, et cetera, a lot of that work is driven domestically. So one of the areas that we've also been looking at is how can we be learning at the international level, state and USAID, from work which has been going on domestically with our agencies so that while we're not looking at a cookie cutter approach, we are looking at principles and policies and looking at ways that we can take that and help share it. Not to put you, not to put you too much on the spot, but 
we're looking for examples of success and disability inclusion. Do you, can you give us a couple of areas, please? Sure. So, I mean, I think in the, in the 16 months that I've been at USAID, I certainly see um, success in the area of policy. Um, within, within the last couple of months, the, the agency has released a number of policies, agenda policy, um, a policy on climate change, and a number of others. And all of these policies have, make reference to persons with disabilities. And for me, that really begins to point to the, the notion of mainstreaming. Um, so we still have our USAID disability policy, but increasingly we're seeing new policies recognizing persons with disabilities as an important group. Um, and so for me, that's been very important. I think in another example that points to um, some success is um, the agency has been developing what we call country development comprehensive strategies. And these strategies are essentially the blueprint for how USAID will engage um, with, with, with the country um, that we're working in. And again, within these CDCSs, we're seeing an increased number of reference to persons with disabilities. And, and for me, this too speaks to the importance of getting it out of just being a disability issue to really being a development issue. And so I'm, I'm really excited by the fact that the CDCSs are increasingly referencing um, disability. And then lastly, I think one of the important areas is we're seeing um, increasingly at mission level um, the interest around the issue. So we're seeing in places like Ethiopia, Malawi, Jordan, um, the, organi the mission organizing itself um, around disability either developing strategies, developing um, disability working groups, um, you know, appointing a disability f a focal point. And for me, this is very, again, very encouraging because it means that at country level, USAID missions are recognizing that this is an important issue. Um, and so that, that, that certainly is an, a, a, an encouraging point. And then just lastly, I mean, you know, I talked about the importance of um, knowledge and um, we've been engaged with a number of people in this room in developing a course for USAID staff um, on disability inclusive development. And, and again, this is you know, with a view towards getting people to understand that this is an important issue. We don't expect everybody at USAID to become a disability expert, but we expect them to have basic knowledge um, so that when they're working on their programs, when they're working on the CDCSs, disability is an issue that they think about. So I think, you know, having identified one of the barriers as knowledge, putting forward and reviewing, uh, revising a course is, is, is very useful. So that's one of the tools that we put in place to address that. Great. Judy? Um, we, we've been following a similar approach, and uh, let me give you some examples of what we've been doing. So uh, points of contact, we call them POCs. Uh, we have been getting points of contact from uh, every component within DRL, but also other offices across the State Department. And for us, that's very beneficial because those individuals then are also becoming more knowledgeable about disability-related issues. And our staff are very much open to spending time with staff here at the State Department to come and talk with us when they have questions. No question is a stupid question. We encourage people to come and ask any question that they have because that's the way people can begin to learn. So the points of contact are very important. Um, we've been collaborating, as I was mentioning earlier, with uh, some of the other uh, federal agencies. So Mike referenced earlier the Vietnam Dialogue that we had recently that our office participated in. And as part of that, there was a field visit and everyone went over to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice gave information on what is going on at justice in the area of Section 504, ADA, elections, etc. We work regularly with the Department of Justice, the Department of Transportation, um, and, and the Department of Education 
uh, education where we've done some particular work, we work with them on a regular basis because people who are coming from overseas frequently are interested in learning more. And so we've done everything from just general briefings to actually helping people go into the field and visit inclusive schools and meet with principals and meet with parents and meet with teachers and get a better understanding of what's going on. We also have done that for a Vietnamese delegation and we've been doing some of that for staff, uh, what we call local staff uh, in the embassies overseas when they come here. Uh, the Democracy, Human Rights and Labor Office under the leadership of Mike uh, now has a course um, on, uh, for DRL on human rights three times a year. Um, there is an hour section in that course and Charlotte and I uh, when we're both in town together, one or the other of us um, are always there, but we try to be there jointly to discuss um, this issue. And we also, the Foreign Service Institute here, which is uh, our training institute, we participate in numerous other trainings. Uh, we also work with MLGA, which is part of the Multilateral Global Affairs Office, part of the DRL, and IO um, on a regular basis to get disability included in UN documents and other related activities, uh, documents. And that I think has been very educational because in reality what's going on there is the people that are working within the State Department have really begun to understand what we are talking about in the area of inclusion. So we're not just interested in looking at things that directly address disability, but we want people to have the perspective that anything is something uh, that we should be looking at and allow them to use uh, their eye to say, when should we be looking at the inclusion of disability, even if it is currently not there. We've had agents, um, departments within uh, state that are also beginning to do more work in the area of disability. So they're contacting us to work on the development of RFAs and RFPs that they're putting together. Um, I was asked if I could also, um, the public diplomacy side of the State Department is currently working on a series of programs uh, with our embassies worldwide. These programs will address international disability rights and will involve sending Americans to other countries to discuss shared goals. Um, if any of you are interested in this, uh, Jennifer Bachner is the person to speak with. And Jennifer, are you still here? So if you could just stand up. Um, some of you have participated in various exchanges that we've been doing, that's been very important. And let me just uh, end on two quick points. One is uh, Ethiopia as an example. USAID uh, began to work on the leadership of a really fantastic person in putting together a strategy. Uh, when we visited Ethiopia, uh, we met with the, um, the ambassador was out, so we met with uh, uh, a charge and uh, talked about expanding what USAID was doing. So, there's now an, uh, a strategic working group uh, that includes USAID and the embassy, but many of our embassies also have other US governmental agencies, and so a number of those other governmental agencies will be are participating in this strategic plan. Uh, and finally, we are really trying to get, and I think successfully achieving, uh, the embassies to actually reach out and meet with uh, disabled people's organizations in country. So uh, ambassadors and charges and others are holding meetings, roundtable discussions, where the disability community is being invited to come in and speak with uh, people in positions at the embassy and USAID to be able to understand more clearly what the issues are. Uh, there was a very interesting example that occurred in Kenya. Uh, we had a group of youth that came in that OSF had been supporting. And uh, one of the women uh, in the group was a deaf woman and explained that in Kenya, if you're deaf, you're not able to drive. Uh, that example was a really powerful one for the staff from the embassy because people really have very limited knowledge about the depths of di discrimination that people are experiencing. And therefore, I think understanding these simple pieces of information really allow people to begin to understand the work that they need to do. So, there's so much going on. Uh, it's, it's incredible and it's exciting. And a uh, follow-up here, Charlotte. Yeah, follow-up. Just at a, at a global, global level, I just wanted to mention that um, in collaboration with the Ministry for International Cooperation in Finland, 
um, USAID was, was um, in Busan last year at the Aid Effectiveness Conference. And it was the first time ever, um, Sam Worthington was, was there too, and it was the first time ev ever that at one of these conferences, we had an entire panel that addressed the issue of disability inclusive development. Um, I would all, you know, urge you to look at the outcomes document from Busan, which actually mentions disability. So I think at a global level, that for me certainly points to one of some one of our success one of our successes. Great. Okay, I've got a 30 seconds for each of you. What do you want as outcomes for this conference? 30 seconds. Can you do it in 30? I can. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's just a. Uh, a more shared understanding of disability rights and the inclusion of persons with disabilities in development. Um, and for us to all take away the fact that this is part of our work. It's not somebody else's work, but it definitely fits into what, whatever it is that we do. Very simple, think about it, um, and that would be what I would hope people would leave with. I would hope that people here do not speak to people you know, that you speak to people you don't know, and you learn more about the organizations that you don't know about, that you look at opportunities to be able to work together and to collaborate together. And that in the breakout sessions that we have today and tomorrow, that they really be opportunities for people to ask questions, to share information, to be open and candid. We see this as a, not the first, because we've had a number of meetings like this, um, but the next stage, because we have more groups involved in the conference today and tomorrow that have not been previously involved in disability-related activities. So uh, working in conjunction with various organizations and governments, Finland is very well represented here today, and we met with them yesterday. We're looking at many different types of opportunities of ramping up the work that we're doing with other governments uh, Finland, Scandinavian governments, and others to really advance this issue. So learning, sharing, and most importantly, a recommitment and expanded commitment for how you're going to address these issues. Great. Well, on behalf of uh, Assistant Secretary Posner and to Assistant Administrator Mendelssohn, to Judy Human and Charlotte McLean Nalapo, um, our deepest thanks. We have finished our plenary session. We are going to transition immediately to our next session, so don't leave the room. There'll be a break in an hour. I just want to say thank you, and on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you.